Hi, I'm Matt Sargent with ABC Acres in Hamilton, Montana. I'm out here today in our high tunnel with a freshly planted bed. This is actually the first of the plantings we have put in our Artemis high tunnel. And we have a lot more plants that we're putting in this bed and the rest of the bed in general. But uh, we're out here today to finish talking about our series on healthy soil. We've just, in our previous videos, we've talked about the importance of taking soil tests, uh, looking at your minerals and good strategies and why you need to do that to maintain the minerals in your soil. An equally key component to the minerals in your soil is the soil microbiology or the soil food web. Today we're going to talk about that in a couple different things. We're going to discuss the basics of the soil food web, how to learn more about it, ways to observe the health of your soil food web's um, diversity, how robust it is, uh, the importance of succession in different parts of your property, as well as um, strategies to maintain, bolster, and benefit a diverse array of microscopic life in your soils. All right. All right, so first things first. In case you're unaware, a very crucial part of soil health is having an active, healthy, microbiological um, component in your soil. Soil is made up of living organisms. Um, everything from microscopic life forms such as amoebas, flagellates, um, various forms of bacteria, to larger organisms, some of which we can see with the naked eye. A great place to learn more about this is Elaine Ingham's um, Soil Food Web website. I'll put a link to that. But the premise is that there's a whole host of organisms that live in the soil to the benefit or detriment of your plants. And we really want to focus on promoting the growth of the good guys and inhibiting the growth of the bad guys. Most of the good guys, or all of the good guys, thrive in aerobic conditions. If your soil has oxygen, they can thrive. If your soil is really compacted, which I'm compacting by leaning on it, I'm trying not to, but if your soil is compacted, doesn't have oxygen, doesn't have pore spaces, you more than likely have anaerobic conditions which are gonna promote the growth of bad guys, much to the detriment of your plants. You can get really geeked out about this and if you're into that, I highly support it. You can learn how to identify the various good guys and use a microscope and really analyze your soil conditions and look at the diversity of organisms, but know that if you have good healthy soil, there's millions, if not billions, of microscopic good guys working to benefit your plants. And the way that this works is the plants are always, or not always, but they're releasing a chemical compound known as an exudate. And an exudate is a mixture of sugars and proteins that is specific to one or more of those microscopic organisms. And say this little plant here says it needs some calcium, it's gonna release an exudate specifically to the life forms that can help bring calcium or make calcium available to this plant, get the calcium near its root zone in the rhizosphere so it can utilize that. It's a symbiotic relationship. So we really want those guys. Um, yeah, and I'm getting kind of sidetracked, but that's, that's sort of the basis of the soil food web. All right, so we have a simple understanding of how the soil food web works, but what if you don't have time, the resources, or the knowledge to really take a close look at that microscopic life in your soil? Um, maybe you can't afford the courses. Maybe you can't afford a microscope. Maybe you're just really busy and you don't have time to sit analyzing slides under a microscope. That's great, because we can use other permaculture principles, observe and react, to assess the life of our soil. If when you're working in your garden, you're planting, you're weeding, whatever, you're noticing larger macroscopic organisms in the soil and a good diversity of them, things like spiders, roly-polies, centipedes, essentially a good diversity of 
larger anthropods or insects, well, they can't be there without a food source. And that food source tends to be the smaller things that you can't see. So if you have a good diversity of those organisms, you know that you've got good stuff going on. If you look at the book Teeming with Microbes, I'll uh, put a little link with the author's name, check it out from the library, maybe buy a copy. He's got great examples of different traps you can set up to catch all these different bugs and assess whether or not they're there. Although when I was first becoming aware of this process, I found that to be really useful. I've learned more and more that I can just use my observations while I'm working in the garden to see if those larger macroscopic soil food web organisms are there. So those are some ways to observe the diversity of life in your garden to make sure that the microscopic stuff is there. The next important thing to consider when you're talking about maintaining and uh, working with your soil microbiology is a simple understanding of succession. And succession is the, an ecological process to bring an area to its climax in any given bioregion. In a lot of places that tends to be a forest. But at the climax, it's, it's the full expression of that bioregion's ecosystem. And before we really delve into that, I need to back up a little bit and touch base on annual plants tend to prefer and thrive in soils that are bacterially driven with some fungal activity, whereas perennial plants tend to thrive in more fungally dominated environments. The process of succession, if you were to disturb an area in an area where the climax expression of the ecoregion is a forest, if you disturb an area, till it all up, pave it all out, at first you'll see annuals come in, then you'll see uh, biennial and herbaceous perennials come in, and each step those different plants are feeding different exudates to attract the microorganisms to improve the soil to the next level. Well, that's great over time, you know, to know that over time, slowly, you know, you can scrub an area clean that was a forest and over time it'll rebuild to a forest. Well, yeah, it, that's great knowledge. The thing is, say you're establishing a food forest. You want to speed up that succession. How can you do it? You can do it by planting a whole diversity of all those different plants, annuals, herbaceous perennials, biennial herbs, um, shrubs, etc., etc. And the more root exudates are feeding the conditions that are going to favor that forest, the sooner that forest is going to thrive. Well, what about a production area like this high tunnel, which is primarily for annual plants? We don't want it successing into a perennial area. If anything, you know, with a 15 foot roof, we can't have an oak tree in here. So we want to keep this to a point where it's bacterially driven. What's the best way to do that? Well, there's two ways primarily. One is looking at how your compost is made and sourced, and two is looking at what you plant. If you have an area that is gonna be predominantly annual production, you don't want perennials to get established in there, whether that's perennial weeds or planting of simple herbaceous perennials. So outside of our high tunnels, we plant all sorts of herbaceous herbaceous perennials to attract pollinators and other good insects to help with pest control in the high tunnel. But in the beds themselves, we focus on just annual plants. Going back to the compost thing, if you're a compost geek, I, I'll admit I'm a compost geek. I love compost. I think it's one of the coolest processes ever. Um, a few years ago, I used to actually specifically buy, you know, beets just because I wanted to compost the leaves. I've since learned that beet leaves are tasty and they don't get composted anymore because I eat them. But there's basically two ways to make compost. You have your slow compost and your hot compost. Within each there's several different strategies but typically your hot compost, something that you're actively managing, turning every couple days to at least once a week, keeping the temperature high, that's going to be a more bacterially driven compost. 
It's gonna have a lot of beneficial bacteria in it, some fungi, but it's gonna be limited amount of fungi. Your slow compost, where you make a big pile of wood chips and manure and let it sit for two, two years or so, let it slowly break down, that's gonna be a more fungally driven compost. And don't get confused here, there's still bacteria in it, but there's gonna be a lot more fungal activity. So those composts are more beneficial for your food forests, your tree plantings, etc. Whereas a hot compost, um, something that's been composted, maintained at temperatures of 150 and higher, that's gonna be better for your annual beds if you delineate. And if you have a food forest, it might be a little bit of everything. But those are two ways to manage succession within your beds. And the last, the last bit to talk about, about maintaining and benefiting your soil food web is considering the plants that you have in it. Right now, this is not a great example because it looks very monoculture. We just started planting in here yesterday. We have a lot to do. Um, and it, right now it is a monoculture. By this afternoon, you can see this lettuce is all spaced out a little farther than lettuce needs to be. We'll be putting some brassicas in here. As the summer progresses and things warm up, we're gonna see basil, calendula, peppers, tomatoes, and a whole diversity of plants. And the biggest thing I can stress is to have that diversity in your planting beds. Um, it can be a little bit harder on the management side because you have a diversity of plants but it's so much more beneficial to your soil because you have a diversity of root structures that, and a diversity of plants that are all releasing different exudates, attracting different beneficial microorganisms and really bolstering that soil food web. The last thing along those lines of benefiting your soil food web is to always, it, it, if possible, always have living plants in the soil. Um, at this point, you should already know bare soil is dead and dying soil. Once we plant more in here, we're gonna bring in some of that magic mulch from our episode Magic Mulch, which is linked right now, to help benefit that. Um, bring in a little bit of fungal activity, but mulch helps with so many in so many ways. If you watch the video, you'll see. But by having a by having living crops in the ground, if at all possible, utilizing cover crops when you don't have an actual crop in the system, you always have plants in the ground feeding those systems. And the main reason we don't have the, anything growing in here right now, except for what we just planted yesterday, is we didn't finish construction of this tunnel until I think it was October. And we didn't start shaping and building the beds until December. If you've ever been in Montana, even in a greenhouse, you're not getting any plants established in December. So we're really happy to be planting this to start feeding the good guys, help get the uh, diversity of the soil built. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope that made sense to you. If you have any questions or comments, we love to hear from you. We do this for you um, and we like engaging with you. So don't be shy to let us know what you're thinking. And until next time, happy growing.